the Edmonton Oilers are very much back alive in the Stanley Cup final. We're going to talk about how they're getting it done. You are Locked On Oilers, your daily podcast on the Edmonton Oilers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello. Welcome to today's episode of Locked On Oilers, where we've got your team covered every day. I want to thank everybody making Locked On Oilers their first listen of the day. I'm your host, Nick Sararis. But before we get to today's episode, it's brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. So we still got another day till Game Six of the Stanley Cup Final, which the Edmonton Oilers are very, very much alive in now, and very excited about that. But we've got some time. Had the had the great pleasure of diving into some numbers, so we'll do that. We're going to start off with. McDavid versus Barkov and McDavid versus everybody else on Florida and why that's so crucial to the Oilers winning in this series if they're going to be able to pull off this comeback. We're going to touch on how Florida typically loses in the games they've lost in these playoffs, which there's not a lot of tape. Florida's had a really good run to get here. We'll we'll do what we can. And then last segment, we're going to look at some of the shot maps from the game so far in this series to kind of paint a picture of how the games have gone and why they've gone the way they have. So starting in the beginning, starting with our conversation of Connor McDavid's minutes at large. So overall in these playoffs, in this series, I should say not in these playoffs in these, in this series, Connor McDavid's played about 60 some odd minutes at five on five. And For the purposes of this conversation, we're largely going to hone in on five on five because that's where a player really kind of exerts their influence on the game. That's not to say you don't uh, on the power play, because very obviously Connor McDavid is the best player in the world, in part because of how he's able to orchestrate the power play and what he does on the man advantage. But the majority of the game is played at five on five. We so we stats people operate under the assumption that somewhere between 77 and 85 percent of the game is going to be played at five on five. So that's why when you see people in the analytics or in the statistics community talking about numbers, they're typically at five on five because that's the vast majority of the game. And it's a little bit it's a little bit more conducive to tracking samples because the the environment is more stable and there's a little bit less variance where special teams, obviously that's kind of the point of special teams is that one team is at a real disadvantage. So it's hard to kind of track what's working there, especially some of the limitations we have with shot tracking data, which can account for pre-shot movement, can account for goalie positioning. So we stick to five on five at large because it's the most actionable information we have. And ultimately, and I said this the other day, and I'll repeat it now if if you're listening to the show for the first time, we're never going to know everything about hockey. We are never going to be able to have a definitive answer about everything because the game is so dynamic. It is very vibrant and it's constantly changing. The game state is the most fluid of all of the sports. You know, if you want to say soccer is the same kind of deal, sure it is. And, you know, there's even less stoppages because we're not operating with special teams in that sense. But you do have free kicks, you do have corner kicks, and that's a kind of comparable to a face off, but same kind of deal. Hockey is very fluid and it's hard to track everything, but at large in Connor McDavid's series so far, they've played 58 minutes of five on five in this series so far. Connor McDavid and Zach Hyman, he has two minutes away from Zach Hyman in this series at five on five, but I don't have these num- those numbers because I don't want to get it confusing because obviously there are minutes that overlap and don't overlap. And we're going to talk about it specifically in relation to Barkov in a minute, but so far, in the playoffs at large. So far, those two players in this series through five games have played 50 and a half minutes together. Most importantly, they are winning the goals for battle at 75%. They have scored three goals at five on five. They've conceded one goal against. They are winning in the underlying battle at everything except for high danger chances. But you got to take the context of typically Florida is going to be able to get to counter. 
because Edmonton's guys, when McDavid and Hyman are on the ice, they're going to be very compressed. They're going to be very close to the net front. And that's going to allow Florida to counterattack quickly. And we know Florida is not as much of a transition team as Edmonton, but those are talented players. You give a Barkov, you give a Kachuk, et cetera. You give those guys opportunities to make some plays happen. They're going to take them if they're there, even though that might not be the team's overall uh, preference. The, the key to understanding their minutes, 8% shooting when those two are on the ice. That includes the defenseman shots. 96 save percentage and that tells me for the most part that Stuart Skinner is not having to work that hard when he's out there his numbers are not great in these playoffs but a 96 save per, a 966 save percentage in the Connor McDavid minutes tells me that more often than not they're not facing a lot of quality you know I, I'm looking at the numbers now They've conceded 13 high danger chances against through five games. It's about two and eight, two and a quarter per game. Obviously, they're not evenly distributed like that, but for the average, for the average of about two and a quarter, that's not a whole lot. You you look over at the hot, the actual score, the raw scoring chances, 62 scoring chances against over five games. It's about 12 per game. So one sixth of the chances per game are high danger, which that's not a great number. But being that they are winning the goals, the actual goals battle, that tells me that Skinner is not having to do as much. And this is what's key for me. And I've talked about this a lot going into the series that when McDavid was away from Barkov, when Dreisaitl was away from Barkov, they were going to have to play well because that was going to be the differentiation point. You know, you expect your stars and their stars to cancel each other out. And then when they're not out there against Florida Stars, you need them to dominate their minutes. And they're winning that they are winning away from Barkov. And then head to head, 50% of the scoring chances, 48% of the shots on goal, 50% of the goals. They're one to one. They've both scored one and conceded one. 50% of the expected goals. Not doing as well as high dan- on high danger, 33%. So Florida definitely having an edge in the quality of scoring chance. But like we just talked about, that's tied to the fact that they're not getting the they are in deep they are more compressed on Florida's net and they're a little bit more prone to counterattack you know Bouchard and Ekholm are most often deployed with McDavid and Hyman but Bouchard not as good in front of his own net Ekholm better of the two but not an elite net front defenseman frankly there just aren't a lot of good net front defensemen to begin with but this is a nice summation of the series the star players canceling each other out and then when mcdavid's away from barkov they're winning whether it's whether it's five on five away from barkov or on the power play the oilers are winning those minutes you look at the counting stats you see mcdavid has 11 points in in five games he has eight over the last two you are talking about something just genuinely extraordinary you know i said it on yesterday's show that you more likely than not you've never seen anything happen if you're of a certain age you know if you're under the age of 30 under the age of 35 you saw the end of gretzky you saw the end of lemieux you saw early Sidney crosby but sid's prime where, where he was this kind of dynamic wasn't very long before he started having the concussion issues whereas mcdavid and dry are just superb you know after the game yesterday Paul Maurice himself, the Panthers coach, said, we take for granted, we're numb to how good Connor McDavid and Dreisaitl are because we watch them so often, and it's true. The plays they are capable of making are absolutely superb. We are going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We'll touch on Florida's weaknesses, what they've done in the playoffs and the games they've lost coming up next, so be sure to stick around. We are in summer that means baseball that means concerts that means the wnba and if you want to get out there you want to go to a game you want to go to a show you have got to check in with our friends over at game time one of the most important apps on my phone the only app i use to buy tickets to go to shows some of the best features in the business Things like zone deals where you choose a section and let game time choose the seats. All in pricing where they show you the total for the tickets up front with no surprise fees at checkouts. My personal favorite seat view. Get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. The lowest price guarantee where game time will credit you 110% of the difference. 
And if you're antsy, Game Time Ticket Coverage, your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the industry. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N H L for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Want to thank everybody making Locked On Oilers a part of their Thursday, whether it's first thing in the morning way to work, on the way to school, on the way to the gym, or if you're on the, and on the way back decompressing at the end of a long day, thanks for taking the time. It's what makes this show fun is the fact that we're all in this boat together as long as this Oilers journey keeps going. And it's been a lot of fun to take it in, to immerse myself in another team, and really get a fundamental understanding of what makes them go and what allows them to play when the Oilers are at their best what that looks like and what when they're not playing at their best, how they get from point A to point B and they get out of whatever funk they're in, whether it's one prolonged shift in their own zone or a couple prolonged shifts in their own zone. You know, I was thinking about it today. I was um, I went for a walk today to just get away from my desk for a little bit. And what was the Oilers response to getting hemmed in their own zone for four and a half straight minutes? Draw a penalty, go on the power play make Florida play defense for two minutes. That kills a lot of time that got that kind of bridged them from the end of game situation to the empty net, you know, at, at the, with the lead they had, it bridged the gap, the one goal lead to the point Florida would pull the goalie. And then Edmonton has the luxury. Well, it's not totally a luxury, but they have the short, the choice to shoot on the net. That's full 200 feet. Even if they ice the puck, they can still kind of aim for the net and ultimately it worked out for them. But it's very fun to have this type of insight and understanding of how another team ticks. And speaking of knowing how another team ticks, I feel that after watching them dismantle the Rangers over six games in the Eastern Conference final, I've got a really firm grasp on what makes Florida successful. And you look at the scores of the games they've lost. They lost one game in the first round, 6-3 to three to Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay was getting obliterated in that series. Tampa Bay had some chances. They very well could have tied game one there at the end. I, I, I can still picture Steven Stamkos lining up a one-timer with about 12 seconds to go that Bobrovsky just makes a really good save on. Then that series probably takes on a different complexion. But 6-3, then game one against Boston, 5-1, sloppy defense. They had a long layoff in between their series because Boston and Toronto went the full seven games in the first round. And then Florida had, I want to say it was like four or five days off between game five against Tampa Bay and game one against Boston came out a bit, a little bit sloppy. Then you had Bennett and Marshans. That thing happens. That's unfortunate. Then Boston wins a squeaker two to one. The Rangers, their first win of the series of the conference final squeaker two to one in overtime. I was there, unfortunately. God, that series is just a tale of what could have been, but I digress. This is not a Rangers podcast. Game three, two days later, the Rangers win 5-4 in overtime. And then we're here in the, in the Stanley Cup final, 8-1 to one game four, 5-3 against Edmonton. And it's not a coincidence that the majority of those games are higher scoring. And we operate in the NHL in 2024 under the assumption this is an offense first league. The average goals per game is going up. The average power play opportunities per game has gone up each of the last handful of seasons. These are the most offensively rich seasons we have in the modern NHL. You know, post-2005, the last four seasons are the highest per-game goal-scoring stats of the of the time period. And you're never going to be able to compare it to the 80s or the early 90s where there's a lot more room, a lot more leeway, bad goalie technique, bad goalie equipment. So you're never going to be able to get as fair of a statistical comparison that's why you need things like error adjustment to account for the fact that poor goaltending poor defense that type of thing but when florida's right when florida's playing their game it's ugly it's boring it's methodical it's cycle four check get the puck behind the net win the board battle rim the puck up to the point and then either our defenseman's going to take a shot and he's going to look for a deflection on the way in 
or we have a screen in front that's going to make some traffic and not give the goalie clean eyes. And that's where we're going to beat them. They do that over and over and over and over again. And the thing that makes it potent and why it's really effective in the playoffs, it limits the amount of defense you have to play. And in today's NHL, where it is so prescient, so pertinent, that you score as much as you possibly can to not have to play defense, that's going to give you an advantage all of the time. When you only have to play minimal defense, that's going to enable you to do a whole lot more offensively. And more importantly, it takes more load off your guys. And we talk about this from an Oilers perspective a lot, this idea that when they have to play more defense, they're more prone to mistakes because of the volume, you know. The more you do something, it doesn't change the individual probability of a sequence, but you add them up over time. And how many how many exit passes do you need to attempt if you're in your own zone for 90 seconds? How many failed exits does it take? And does one failed exit lead to another failed exit because the way Florida likes to play? where they own the boards, especially if you're trying to break out from your own behind your own net. And that's where they start to wear you down, where even if they're not putting shots on your net, they still have the puck. You're on defense. You got to be on your toes. You got to keep passing off your assignments, men to men. And that's where they start to pick you apart. And in these playoffs, when they've had hard times, it's because the other team has gotten going in transition or in the case of the two, the uh, the two one Rangers win and the two one Boston win, they lost the rock fight. You know, we, we talked about a lot that Florida likes low event hockey. They don't want a lot of scoring chances. You know, kind of what game two was, where there just wasn't a lot of room. It could have gone either way. That's Florida's ideal game state because they feel the way they play, the stars they have, and the goaltending they have. If we reduce the game to a coin flip. We think our guys are more often than not going to beat your guys in those coin flip instances. We're talking about a handful of plays swinging games. And against 30 of the 32 teams in the league, Florida's got the stars to overwhelm them more often than not. You get Barkov going, you get Kachuk going, you get Reinhardt going, you get Verhage going, you get Sam Bennett going. Most teams, that's enough. Edmonton is one of the handful of teams that has a real argument to say our stars are just as good, if not better than yours. And then it comes down to our depth, because like we talked about in the first segment, Edmonton's and Florida stars are when they've been head to head. It's one to one when it's Barkov against McDavid at five on five. When they're away, that's when McDavid's been able to open things up and put some pucks in the net. But before we move on, one last thought on this idea. It is going to be really difficult to get Florida to open up to concede defensively. But when Edmonton's won in these in this series, it's because they've been able to get the game going up and down. Florida is going to do everything they can to let the air out of the balloon deflate this game and make it low event, make it low energy, take the crowd out of it, make the game come down to Stuart Skinner versus Bob, Barkov versus McDavid, Dreisaitl versus Kachuk, slow it down and force somebody to make a play outside of structure, make a special play. And that's a calculated risk against Edmonton, who has the best player in the world, who is capable of making something special happen every single time he touches the puck. But you saw the first three games of this series. There was not a lot of room out there. Edmonton, if they're going to win, probably needs to win a squeaker and when i say win i mean the series they're probably going to need a two to one or a three to two just because of the way these series have gone for florida i don't think that type of game benefits edmonton in the slightest but from a theory perspective of how florida's series have played out and what florida's strengths are edmonton probably needs to win a rock fight and that's either going to be game six or god willing game seven if they're going to be able to make it happen we're going to take one more break. We'll be right back. We'll talk a little bit about where Edmonton is scoring from, where their scoring chances are clustered, and a whole lot more. So be sure to stick around. Hey, Oilers fans. I want to take a moment to bring up one of our partners, the mobile game Ultimate Hockey GM. 
Ever dreamed of becoming an NHL GM and managing your hockey franchise? Do you think you could run the Oilers better than Ken Holland? Do you want to take the job when Ken Holland leaves whenever the Stanley Cup final is over? Well, your dream can come true, and this game is most definitely for you. Manage every strategic aspect of your team, play through the seasons, and lead it to glory. Hire the coaches, the staff, trade players, or draft picks, navigate free agency, and the draft all in a challenging and realistic game world. As an Oiler fan, you know there's no off-season. GMs are constantly making moves at every point of the year to improve their team's chances. That's why I think you're going to love this game. Downloaded it the other day. Took a little bit of time to set it up. Had to customize a few things, but I'm, I'm enjoying it so far. I got it on my iPad. Yes, I'm an iPad kid. It's one of my character flaws. I'm sorry. Ultimate Hockey GM is completely free and playable offline. Play on the go as you want and when you want to. Locked On Podcast listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo Locked On NHL in the game store. So make sure to check it out. Download the game. Visit hockeygm.app on a web browser or look it up on the Apple App Store or Google Play. Ultimate Hockey GM. Start your dynasty today. I want to thank everybody listening to today's edition of Locked on Oilers. Went a little long in the second segment, so we won't harp too much on what we were going to talk about here. But the one thing I want to show, and I'm going to pull up the heat map, the shot maps in a minute, is just the difference between the games the Oilers have won in this series and the ones they've lost in the context of score effects. You've heard me mention that term quite a bit in this series as it's gone along, that the team that gets out to the lead, because most of these scores have been pretty lopsided. They've turtled, they've shelled, they've played a lot more defense, and that's going to make these underlying numbers look a little uglier than they probably actually are. So I'm going to toggle this on. I'm going to pull up the map from this is game. This is game four. This is what the Oilers won the other night. And you're going to see Edmonton won this game. Edmonton wins this game. They get out to a lead. And you very quickly realize, you see, because Edmonton has a lead, Florida is more inclined to throw pucks from everywhere. And I'm going to zoom in on the Florida half of this, because this is largely about Florida, at least for right now, because we're talking about score effect. The Oilers get out to a lead. They start to turtle. They're not as inclined to worry about offense. You see the cluster. You see all of these scoring chances for Edmonton here that come from below the circles in this dangerous area versus you look at it from florida you look at all of these scoring chances over the circles these are very low quality these are often shot by defensemen they don't have a lot of probability of going in but it speaks to the type of team florida is they're playing from behind they know they have to get the puck on the net because they need rebounds they need second chance scoring opportunities they need the other team to kind of give them something, whether it's a deflection, a rebound, a second chance opportunity. They need to get the puck on the net. And then I'm going to switch over to a different game here. I'm going to switch over to this is game one, and this is going to illustrate a similar point. If it'll buffer, it might take a second. Okay, you see game one, the Panthers got out to the three nothing lead and you see Edmonton just turn it on crazy. They had the puck in the Florida zone most of the night, but Edmonton, excuse me, Florida gets out to the lead. They don't need to throw all of those pucks out here from the top of the circles from the point. And you see Edmonton's got a lot of dangerous chances here in and around the, the, the high danger area, the slot, the bottom of the circles, but they've got that volume. They've got these shots from outside, these low quality, something that's not likely to result in a goal. Then we'll go over to game two, the one we were talking about before in the last segment of when Edmonton has struggled in this series. You look at this. They got one good look in game two, and this is the Connor McDavid breakaway where Kachuk got him from behind. You could have argued maybe there was a hooking there, but you do that in comparison to Florida. Florida's got this congested area all in and around. So Florida wins the game on low event. They get goals down low. And this is where you want to be. You want to be between the circles. You don't want these high shots. You don't want to be shooting from outside. I'm going to toggle off those heat maps, but you understand the point I'm trying to make here. When Edmonton is winning in this series, it is off of transition. 
It is off the rush. They are getting the puck on net. And because teams have gotten out to big leads in these series, the underlying numbers, absent context, are a little bit misleading. Yes, the other team has had opportunities to level the game up. You know, we we talked about the idea the Oilers had eight minutes to survive when Florida got that lit, when Florida got the margin within one in game five. And it took a lot for Edmonton to be able to hold on. But because they had the lead, they were able, they were content to play more defense. Florida takes crappier chances. We talk about game one. Florida gets out to the big lead. Edmonton's chasing it. They're a little bit desperate. They're throwing pucks from any and everywhere, trying to get heat, trying to get some heat on Bobrovsky just to see what happens. And you heard me talk about in the last segment, the idea that the Oilers are probably going to need to win an ugly game, whether that's game six or God willing, like I said before, game seven. And to do that, it's going to take a special effort. You're going to need Skinner pretty close to perfect. You're going to need Nurse and CC and Kulak and Broberg and Eckholm and Bouchard. You're going to need pretty close to perfect from everybody on your back end to win a game two to one or three to two. A lot of the goals against Skinner in this series have been because his defensemen have not done him favors, whether it's turnovers, it's failed zone exits, it's blocking shots into their own net. You're going to need pretty close to a perfect effort if you're going to win one of those rock fight style games. And that's not something that suits Edmonton. I know they were able to do it against Dallas, but Florida is a little bit better than Dallas. So with that in mind, we're going to wrap up today's show. So if you could be so kind, please subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the alarm bell, leave me a notification. Do you think the Oilers can win one of those two to one or three to twos against Florida? Let me know in the comments down low. I will talk to you guys tomorrow ahead of game number six up in Alberta. I'll talk to you guys then. Till then, let's go Oilers.